Hi, everyone. Welcome to Foresight's Existential Hope podcast, the first special episode with Sarah Walker that we've been looking forward to for a really long time. Um, I am not even quite sure where I first came across you, but then uh, once I did, uh, kind of like you were everywhere uh, to the extent that I think you were one of the only people that I know of, at least, that went on next treatment twice. Once, I think, solo, and then once to debate uh, Lee Cronin um, on, like, anything from Origins of Life to uh, kind of, like, Alien Life and, like, Long-Term Futures in Space. And it was a really inspiring debate, I think. It was really, really cool. Um, definitely tackled a lot of different ground. And then I did some research and, you know, found you also, uh, of course, with Dan Dennett and I think Nick Lane uh, mm -hmm. debating similar questions a while back, uh, which are both uh, big heroes of mine, too. And yeah, you're just like a really, I think, uh, very broad, um, very broadly focused, uh, if that's even a word, uh, an oxymoron, a very broadly focused like researcher. Um, and I think I've mentored and like tutored a bunch of people also in their way of like trying to find their way around really difficult questions around the kind of like origins of life, complexity of life, different life forms. What even if is life? Are there other life forms out there? When will we meet them? Um, have, yeah, there, is it possible that they're already around? And what are our long-term um, potential in space and so forth? So I think uh, we definitely won't run out of like, you know, fun, niche, controversial topics to talk about today. Uh, but maybe we'll just start it off with something like super simple, which is uh, if you would have to describe your own life story in like a few sentences, um, then yeah, what would that be? How would you kind of describe your own path? How did you get to where you are? And wh where is it actually currently uh, that, uh, that you are? I know that you're wearing different pets as well. Yeah, um, I'm currently based at Arizona State University, um, but I have affiliations with a couple other places, which are fun to diversify what you think about. Um, but I, uh, I guess my earliest days, I got really romanticized by physics, which is maybe a little odd. I went to community college when I started university and I took a physics course and I just thought physics was the most amazing topic that we could understand the universe at such a deep fundamental level. And so I was kind of dead set at that stage that I was going to become a theoretical physicist, but I didn't really know what that meant because I thought it meant studying like cosmology and particle physics and things that physics had historically been good at. But the real reason I was attracted to physics in the first place was because of this idea of deep explanations that actually drive humanity forward and really allow us to explain more. But from those explanations emerge new technologies and new ideas. Um, and so when I really started to realize that that was sort of like my core interest was already after I was a PhD student and I had started working on the problem of the origin of life. And the origin of life is a really interesting problem because it's one of those open scientific questions where it's so hard that I'm not even sure that we frame the question right yet, which is one of the reasons it's hard to get to an answer. And so for me, that was incredibly exciting because it was like this open frontier where you know, it seems so obvious we should know what life is, yet we don't when we try to get to these deep explanations. And so if we could really come to understand what we are, that would open potentially an entirely new vision for what the future looks like. So I think uh, those are the the things that really excite me about focusing on the origin of life problem and why I think it's one of the most important problems of our time. Yeah. Uh, and I think many of the other problems kind of like burn out from that, like literally. Uh, yes. And I uh, you on like the kind of like interest in physics also for the explanation part. Like we just had David Deutsch on literally like oh, a, nice. in our, our last uh, podcast. And I think, you know, he's really all about the power of explanations. And I think that. Um, yeah, yeah, he really inspired me a lot. And that actually, like, I, I really love his approach to thinking about how explanations transform the future. And so I think about that a lot when I think about what theories are. When you build yeah, them, yeah, it's relatively meta, you know. But I yeah. think then, uh, then I think it kind of percolates through into every you know part of your uh, of your existence, whether it's like in a scientific domain or just like you know, frankly, in your personal one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> ideally, ideally, it's not that we yeah, always yeah. do a good job at that, but like ideally. Right. Okay. Wonderful. Well, maybe um, you know, if like if someone else was kind of like you know coming into your field, and I know that you've, I think you know, really like taught and mentored and instructed like a bunch of really young folks mm -hmm. um, and was trying to make sense of your space, you know, like it's, it's so wide um, yeah. uh, and kind of like, and, and and so kind of like differentiated, like what would you even tell them? What's a bird's eye view of like, you know, what are your, what are your research questions that you address? Like what's a, yeah. what's, what's even an explanation of of the space that you're in if someone else came new to the, uh, to, to the table now? Yeah, I mean, I think the easiest way to think about it is really that there's only one question I'm really interested in answering, and that's what is life. Um, 
And part of my motivation for that is really because I want to understand the origin of life and the transition from when, you know, a universe without life to a universe with life. And that seems like a pretty radical transformation. But because that question is so broad and so deep, it touches a lot of areas. So um, my research group is actually fairly eclectic. I have a lot of PhD students that come in with seem like totally different interests. Um, so just as a couple examples, like one of my PhD students is interested in whether there's law, laws that govern civilizations and their long-term future and how they get off planet. Another one is really interested in artificial general intelligence and how do we build intelligent machines. Another one is, you know, have a geochemist background and really interested in like the geochemical underpinnings of ecosystems. So you get this sort of like very eclectic mix of people from exoplanets to AI to everything else. But the core unifying theme is understanding that life manifests in a lot of different things that we study. And if we can actually develop a deeper understanding across those different domains, we may actually solve this really hard problem. So I think, um, you know, on the surface, it looks like it's a lot of different stuff. Uh, but for me, it's actually really this one question. Um, and if you look at the history of physics, it's it's very true that when we like sort of tunnel through and make these new explanations that are very expansive, they unify and compress a whole bunch of stuff that we thought was totally different before we really came up with that kind of explanation. So I guess we're trying to be as open-minded as possible to what the explanation of life is and trying to just study that problem in as many domains as possible to try to figure out what is actually common across all these different ways of asking the question. Wow, that's crazy. So, I mean, it literally goes from like civilizational kind of like scaling laws to celebrate to AGI. <laughs> it's nuts. Um, and from the origin like, of life in chemistry, everything pretty much subsequent to like the origin of life transition on this planet is life. So, uh, <laughs> so it's kind of um, interesting. And in some ways you might think about what's happening with our technology as being the origin of life recapitulating at a different scale. Um, you know, I think about it as planetary scale technology. Um, and if you think about the origin of life as a planetary scale transformation in geochemistry that happened 3.8 billion years ago and has elaborated ever since, you start to see these sort of recurring structures across scales and technology seems to be doing something interesting now. So it's a fun time to be an origin of life scientist and looking for patterns across these different systems. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit more about patterns? I mean, like, I think from game theory, like one that like maybe has to humans is like, just like reciprocal altruism so far, like mm -hmm. more or less, but like, I mean, there are like some, I guess like, you know, those are not even like a meta law. I wouldn't even say, for example, that like David Deutsch, the power of explanation uh, would count as one. Like what counts as a civilizational uh, law? Does it have to do with something with energy constraints? Like what, what do you yeah. think is the point here? Um, so actually the thing that I'm most interested in is what kinds of things get to exist. So like our imagination seems like it's unbounded and there's lots of things we can imagine could exist but don't exist. Yet at the same time, our imagination in some sense defines the horizon of what gets to come to exist in, in modern civilization. So we're building all of these new technologies based on what we can imagine is possible. And so for me, sort of the deepest structure of the physics of life is actually that the universe doesn't just generate every possible thing that could exist. It only generates some things and they're historically contingent. So there's some selection and information that has to be built up over time. Um, in order to make complex things. And so in some ways, I think about the physics of life as being the physics that generates novelty or creativity in the universe. And therefore, if you think about what we're doing as a, a sort of globally integrated biotechnosphere right now, we're one of the most creative structures we know of in the universe, which means we're probably one of the most alive. Um, and that process to me is is super deeply fascinating. So if I look across life and I say, what's the most distinctive thing life is doing that I can't regularize in terms of current descriptions in physics, it would be this process of generating novelty and selecting on things that are generated to actually build the future. Um, so I don't think the future is predetermined. I think it's open. And I think basically everything that's existing on the planet now is actively constructing that. Well, that's a relatively optimistic take, you know, like, <laughs> I think it's a, you know, pretty open to just, uh, it's a great one. At the same time, you also said that, you know, there are specific things, like, I guess the, the kind of like the conceptual space of our imagination is actually like influencing a lot, like what can be produced uh, in the yeah. universe. I do you think like this universe or like um, the universe as the multiverse of different universes? Like, yeah, so it's interesting because I think the multiverse is, is a real thing, but it's not real in the sense we think about it. It's like, the, I, I don't believe in anything outside of like our current physical universe because I'm a physicist and I have these biases. 
But I do think that our ability to imagine these possibilities is actually causal to what happens in this universe. So if we couldn't imagine things, we can't do them. And so even our ability to reason counterfactually about what other universes is possible allows us to understand the physics of our universe better, which allows us to do more things in this universe. So I think imagination is actually opening up the possibility space in this universe. And that is what I would attribute sort of the causal power of multiverse imagination. But I wouldn't say the multiverse is a real thing for me. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Interesting. Very, very yeah. interesting. Um, okay, cool. So, you know, you've been in that field now for how long, would you say? Um, so I think I finished my PhD in 2005. So I guess I've been at it for a little while. That's crazy. Uh, wait, no, sorry. That was my undergrad. PhD was 2010. Sorry. I'm like, I can't even date myself. Um, yeah, time's a weird thing. Um, so, yeah. And I've been at ASU for like, I think, 11 years now or 12 years. Uh, wow. First as a postdoc okay. and then on the faculty. Yeah, I love ASU. Uh, I I was once there on a on a panel. I think it's really wonderful how they like square like the really deep questions, um, with like actual scientific, uh, you know, like rigor and, and and expertise. Like I think some of the quirkiest events are always at ASU. Yeah, I love ASU too <laughs> for that reason. It's great. It's really great. Um. Okay. So then, I mean, okay, you've been there now for like about like 10, 11 years or something, right? Yeah. Or perhaps. Yep. And um. So do you have there been any like exciting kind of like cultural shift? or like you know I guess like new ideas on the block where you're like oh okay that's you know we can now talk about this and we're unable to uh before that like I know that you know in previous podcasts and so forth you've also talked a little about like UFO sightings and so forth and like like have there yeah. been any like just culture shifts like like, like stretching of the Overton window uh even at ASU which I think already has a pretty broad overview yeah window. Uh, that uh, that you think are just like interesting to note where someone who's new uh, to the field may just like, you know, kind of like get a head start by knowing that this is now an okay thing to talk about. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I can tell you sort of a major one in my career, at least in Origins of Life, which I have been like deeply fascinated to watch this shift. Um, so when I started in the field, uh, I was a PhD student in theoretical physics. And I remember going to Origin of Life conferences and it would just be like, I don't know, like, 90 organic chemists and like 10 biologists and maybe like one physicist out of like 101 people or something. So, um, or maybe the ratios were a little different than that, but, but the point is the field was predominantly, um, chemists that were really interested in synthesizing the building blocks of life. And there wasn't a lot of emphasis on the, these sort of broader systems level understanding of what life is or thinking about life as not substrate specific. So not like a chemistry specific phenomena. And there has been, I think, in the course of my career, a radical shift where people are starting to recognize that maybe life is much more about information processing and these sort of more abstract properties. And we don't need, necessarily need to talk about them as being chemical, uh, like properties that only appear in chemistry, let alone specific chemistry that we see life on Earth using. So you can have like a conceptual shift where you say, the chemistry life on earth uses is not the only possibility. It might be other possible chemistries, but then another conceptual shift where you say, well, really when we're talking about life, it might be a broader class of phenomena. And of course we can think about like silicon based life, but even broader than that, can you think about life as a phenomena that exists across scale? So like, it's not just an individual cell, but populations of cells or hierarchies in biology, like um, you know, ecosystems or planetary scale processes might equally be alive. And those things had always been sort of themes. Obviously, they're, you know, like people have been talking about those kind of processes and different ways of describing life for a long time. But I think it's becoming much more mainstream in origin of life specifically to bring in some of these ideas from complex systems and, and other ways of thinking. So that's been really exciting. Um, yeah, uh, that was the biggest what, what one. Is your, what is your definition of life that's like substrate more, or at least more substrate independent? Yeah, I have a lot of different definitions of life. And actually, like the thing I'm thinking about most is like the relationship between life information and time. But, um, and I can get to that in a minute, but sort of my working things I say when I talk about what life is, is I say life is like how information structures matter across space and time. So for me, when I talk about an example of life, it's not like, an individual cell or an individual human being, it's there was some transition in the physics of our planet early on. And now we've entered this, oh, entered this open-ended cascade where memory of the past is retained that actually allows building new possibilities in the future. And it's that entire structure across space and time over 3.8 billion years so far and whatever it generates in the future that is an example of life. 
Um, and I think that's a really different conceptualization of what life is than you might historically hear, particularly in my field, where it's things like life is a chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution or something, which is very narrow and very specific. Um, but one of the reasons I think you need to go broad and abstract is usually, again, looking at the history of physics, it's like these very deep abstractions end up looking a lot different than the phenomena they originally intended to describe, but they're much more encompassing in extent, explanatory breadth and reach to use like David Deutsch's terms um, in terms of what they can actually describe. And I think that's going to be much more useful. The relationship to time actually comes out of the theory that I'm developing with Lee Cronin um, called assembly theory, which aims to explain uh, features that we associate to life and also be used as a tool for solving the origin of life. We're basically trying to build a theory that allows us to design the experiment to solve the origin of life. Um, and that theory really suggests that one of the most interesting things is like the information necessary to build an object becomes an intrinsic feature of the object. And this has the implication, at least for me philosophically, that's super interesting, that complex objects or living objects actually have a size and time. Um, so I have a friend, Michael Lachman, who talks about himself being 3.8 billion years old because some pieces of all of us are that old, right? So like we all share the inner structure of the ribosomes that are in our bodies helping make proteins. And that structure is a structure that is a pattern that has persisted on this planet for 3.8 billion years. So I sometimes talk about that as one of the earliest technologies. And if we're thinking about building future technologies, you know, we haven't built anything we expect to last for 3.8 billion years, yet life has invented such technologies in the past, so it might be possible. Um, so yeah, there's a, I think there's yeah. a really interesting analogy that um, I once discussed, or Mark Miller discussed once with me, I was also for the senior fellow, and he basically said, you know, hey, look, like once we have super longevity, if we ever get there, right, we need to radically update our understanding of what it is to be us. Yes. Because, you know, currently it's like this identity similarity over time that makes me think I'm me. But if we live like very, very long time periods and have like this propensity for like radical change, then it is really more like a broad, broader definition of like, you know, you grow into something that is proud of the yeah. version of yourself or something. And uh, you kind of analogize it with like the definition of a civilization. It's like, you know, it's not really like I'm part of the Roman civilization or something, but to some extent, like, you know, I'm the product and I'm like sometimes, you know, like kind of like, humbly and like gratefully looking back at a few of the things that they did um and i think that you know you have this like i think like kind of like larger definition of life um that kind of like almost evolves and like emerges like over time yeah I think it's really okay. interesting and, and and kind of like analogous yeah. to this no I, I like that a lot like sometimes i think like like i think of myself as a te temporary aggregate of information and like all of us are just like these these temporary aggregates out of this larger structure that's unfolding over time and building more things and, and features of that persist and they aggregate into new things and new objects um, over time. But like all of the particular things you see in the biosphere are temporary, but all of that information is still propagating through material um, substrates. So um, so for me, that that's actually what life is. But the, the thing that's super interesting is that temporal structure. And, and you have to take time like very seriously, I think, when you're thinking about what life is and thinking about ourselves as being very old objects having a large size and time brings this kind of really interesting dimensionality to physics that I don't think has been present before. So things can only exist after the information exists to build them. So there's like this whole structure you can add to the space of things that can be created in the universe if you would take time seriously as a feature of the project. Yeah. Okay. So now like there are things that we can build now just information wise that we weren't able to do at all before. Yes. Okay. Um, I mean, I think uh, generally this notion is like a nice notion of dealing with existential doom because, you know, to some, to some, if you are part of this like larger informational, um, you know, like, I guess, you know, evolution really, then, um, you know, your physical body decaying uh, is perhaps like sad, but not quite as sad as, yeah. as it would otherwise be. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I think there's always the issue of like our self-identity as an individual, but then there's the imprint we leave in the world. And I think like those imprints are things that are much like, at least presently how I think about it, much more likely to be immortal potential, you know, like or achieve some level of near immortality than my identity as a self, which might just be a construction of my mind. And it's not even a real feature of me to begin with. So <laughs> um, yeah, that, that's the other little problem about it, I guess. Yeah. Um, um, okay. Well, how did like, I'm super curious, like how did, 
perhaps like, you know, the recent, especially like, you know, explosion in different, in interest, uh, or like, I guess the rekindling in interest in AI, which like, I think, mm -hmm. you know, has always been like really strong, at least in the like Bay Area, like where yeah. it seem. But like recently you see like a little bit more the mainstream, like picking up on it again. And frankly, like, I think most of my days are now mostly spent with like a radically refreshing, like nonlinear library or like, you know, other more like AI and AI safety um, discussions and mm -hmm. just like I think like progress is really just like accelerating in a like baffling way yeah. and I wonder if I mean if you plug into this at all and like if yeah, if if you are how that influences your definition of life I know that like on on a different channel you discuss like this kind of like exponential population growth of like also AI life forms that you know we may be witnessing soon so I'm just super curious you know how did the yeah. kind of like recent kind of like interest explosion in in, in the intelligence explosion and I kind of like influence your uh, definition of life and, and, and intelligence and so forth. Yeah, I've been trying to understand uh, exactly that question for a little while and how we might be able to think about the transitions happening now in a longer view if we contextualize them in the history of life on Earth and like the future that we think life is going. And I think about it in terms of I guess the easiest way to frame it is in terms of major evolutionary transitions. So if we look at the history of life on Earth, I think people will talk about major transitions in evolution as being transitions in information processing and storage. So you had, for example, with the advent of cells, like the technology, the ribosome and, and DNA and digital storage of information, and then um, new information processing uh, modalities had emerged for multicellular organisms to exist and then societies. And now what we're seeing is basically like multi-societal structures emerging with like the global integration of humans. And basically what I think is happening that's super interesting to me is we're taking a lot of like, if you if you want to take a technological lens on biology in the same sense that you take a bio, biological lens on technology, we're taking a lot of technologies that were invented very early on in the history of life on earth. And we're now recapitulating them at larger and larger scales. So if you want to think about the entire planet as a living structure, it's it's emerging new layers of complexity, and that's really what the technological transition is. So to take a non-AI example, you can look at things like eyes, yeah. right? So like early, um, fo like early in the history of life, like no organism could see, right? And then photon receptors had to evolve. And then when you get to multicellular organisms, you had individual cells that could detect light, but then you get 70 different kinds of cell types that have different light sensitivities that form the human eye. And then you get to societies and we still start building things like microscopes and telescopes so that we can see sort of different modalities of like the structure of reality, right? And now what we're seeing with the kind of technology we're inventing is taking patterns in the brain and trying to actually put them into technology. So I think I think if you take this sort of more global view and you think about the globally integrated system, it's, it's kind of very clear that we're just, uh, like I would think about it is emerging new concepts of organism and organism and Minality, I don't know how to pronounce that word, at like higher scales. And so I think about like te the technosphere itself as a living system and just saying that like these AI are just different ways of like integrating that system at this global scale so that life can persist at that scale. And then that might be necessary to actually getting off planet because if you think about a planet as a sort of a living structure, in order for it to reproduce itself and to actually have another planet come alive, it might have to go through this technological phase of development. So um, so those are sort of the ways I think about thinking about this sort of informational perspective on life and what structures we're building now and how they lead to sort of more growth and open-ended complexity and what that might look like. Very cool. Well, um, it also reminds me of another bit that Mark Miller always said of like, is this notion of like civilization as a super intelligence and like there's, you know, uh, have been for a while, computer intelligence have been a part of it. And, you know, over time, maybe the fraction of intelligence that gets kind of contributed is going to be larger um that um by, that that gets contributed by machines it's going to be larger than that contributed by humans um, right you know because they, they may be like out competing us on some of these bits but nevertheless like the larger structure is still civilization uh, at large that is the kind of like growing super intelligence and i thought that was like always a really interesting i think like just yeah kind of, like description but it, it it does rely to some extent on this kind of like more symbiotic notion of like different intelligence right. being more cooperative so i really wonder like it sounds like you have a pretty optimistic take about I oh, do. I mean, I guess I don't see. AI. Yeah, I don't see it as competition. It's like I'm not in competition with the individual cells in my body. There's like like I'm a collective feature of them, and I feel like 
some of the discussions at, about AI or like the AI are competing with us as individual humans rather than thinking about the AI as being an emergent structures of the interaction of societies of humans. And it might actually be some glue to make that like actually a living structure at that scale. And so, um, so when I hear like questions about existential risk in AI, I think more about like, oh, we're building, we're trying to build an immune system. <laughs> Uh, like what would be the immune so planetary scale immune system for technology? Because that's really like, how do you protect yourself for longevity? Um, but I don't really see a lot of discussions in existential risk because it's it's very focused on this notion of the individual rather than thinking about these things as these kind of larger scale patterns that, um, you know, we're embedded in. We're not like, we're not the large, we're not the pinnacle of evolution or the most a live structure as individual humans on the planet. Actually, we can't even survive out of societies at, at this point. So if you think about like individual cells in your body can't live outside your body, but individual humans also can't live out of human societies. I think like the average lifespan of a human outside of society nowadays, because we don't have wilderness training and stuff is like, I think three weeks or something. So, so I don't think, I don't think that we think about ourselves as collectives, but if we do, and we talk about AI at that scale, I think it, it changes the discussion of what it is. But I should also say, like, to your point about this is very hopeful, I have a very hard time with, like, negative future scenarios. Like, my brain just doesn't work that way. It's like everything's hopeful. Um, right. <laughs> so I'm, like, I'm one of those people that turns, like, even, like, the the, the most pessimistic things into positive things that I don't it, – and it's probably because I have this deep, intrinsic – a view that the narratives we build become the future and because I think theories matter so much to what gets constructed that I I have a hard time envisioning negative futures because I feel like that's the easiest way to make them happen is to only focus on those kind of scenarios so you you can't you can't build something you can't imagine yeah uh, I, I certainly agree with that I, last night I listened to the we're all gonna die podcast with Eliza Yukowski and Bankless which is like I think the recent kind of pinnacle of um AI AI doom and like look I, I came away with like a really like it was pretty sobering and he has like just like he has good arguments and um, there's nothing oh, really? Uh, really about that and I think like one thing that I want to mention about your point is um you know about like the more hopeful interpretation of AI I think like there are some texts, I think maybe even Will McAspill with an EA, like he doesn't uh, classify uh, a conscious AI outliving humans as an existential risk, because at that point there would still be something that's conscious and it's like, uh, yeah. kind of like uh, li li living potentially even like somewhat of, an, uh, of a life that is potentially human aligned, who knows, um, or at least it's aligned with, it, uh, with its own right. goals. But I think one worry that people have is that, you know, um, that, um, the AIs that we're creating may not be conscious or sentient and, and so forth. Yeah. So we are creating this more kind of like, I think Russell at one point called it Disneyland without children of like extremely yeah. good optimizer or like meta optimizers, but uh, which are like, you know, building kind of like Dyson sphere, mm -hmm. like there's no tomorrow, but like there's no one there to actually like consciously live and experience them, including right. perhaps no bias we left because they're actually turning everything into kind of computer room. So I think that's more like the, uh, or like it's one of the worst. I mean, people have very different worries. And we see, yeah. I, I, they do them all justice, but do you have any um, kind of like fear of that at all? Or so like just this kind of like more well, I technological think... takeover that is not conscious or like not an evolution of life, but like is destructive of like a conscious or sen sentient life form at least? I guess I just don't, I don't see any concrete evidence that suggests to me that that's a real possibility. Um, so I think it, I, it goes back to like imagination and what's possible. I think that there are a lot of things that we can imagine based on like our kind of primitive understanding of things, which we're always no matter where we are in history, we don't really fully understand ourselves or our place in the universe or what the universe is, right? Like we have approximations and we have adequate explanations for the time we live in. Um, I don't I don't see that being something that I feel like is a physically real possibility because I just don't see in the history of life evidence of such things or evidence that like we're actually building technologies that display those properties even if they might be currently based on some optimization function. I just don't know how that manifests as a real like physical thing, not just an algorithm. Um, and algorithms are physical for me, but they're not physical in the way that people talk about them in software. So uh, so I, I, I feel like the, <laughs> it, yeah, I, I guess it's just, I, I can't build a physical intuition around those kind of scenarios. And um, I don't, yeah, I don't see any consistency with them. 
I love it. Let's leave it at that. I'm not going <laughs> to push it any further. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Beatrice now, who's really digging into the more Excel part uh, of this discussion. And um, yeah, I uh, like the way that uh, you might is like default working in positive scenarios. And uh, I wonder if that's just a natural thing, perhaps to, to close it out, or is if that is actually because you think that it is more effective and um, not hurling down to what's the uh, like basically like if not thinking about the bad scenarios is more effective at avoiding them like is it more like a natural thing where you just like end up thinking about the positive things more or is um, it like specifically kind of like targeted because you think it's instrumental to not reaching the bad worlds to not think about them very much i think it's both i think naturally my personality is disposed that way but um but i think because i study life like i have to take this meta perspective on the things that i do so i was doing like uh what i was calling uh these thought experiments on like the theoretical physics of theoretical physicists, uh, which is is sort of along the lines again of how David Deutsch thinks, but um, about explanations. But like a very you know sort of specific example is the invention of Newtonian gravity, which is a particular kind of abstraction, a theory that emerged on our planet after many billions of years of evolution, and then many you know millions of years of human evolution, and thousands of years of the modern thought and you can actually trace the whole lineage of things leading to Newton's idea of gravity, right? And as this sort of pattern, regular pattern that we see persisting um, in our environment. And um, and then what you see downstream of that is that we build things like satellites and new technologies emerge out of that understanding. And so I guess because I think of theories as being these properties already that emerge out of evolutionary structures and then they, they in part are actually what steers and builds the future. I have to think about constantly correcting my, like, like I think that structure is life, yet I'm doing the same thing by trying to build theories to understand life. And so that sort of transition kind of constantly is forcing me to have this sort of positive outlook because I want to make sure that whatever theory we have that describes us also helps perpetuate <laughs> that we have some longevity associated to us. So I, I, I actually have a sort of theory building of, not Occam's razor, but like a theory building of positivity. Like what are the things that, what are the theories, what are the explanations we can give ourselves that build the largest possible future? The Walker razor. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's a great point for me to hand it over to Beatrice. Thanks so much. This was very, very fun. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining, Sarah. Um, it, it seems like you've answered like a bunch of my questions already and that like you seem very positive about the future, which is usually what I ask. Um, people uh, and also um, your work seems very existential in in a lot of what you've uh, talked about so far and um, and you know it's been interesting to hear what, what you think about like our background and our origin um, and yeah very curious to hear what you're going to say about the future um, so like you seem very connected to these questions but as we want more people to engage with these questions I was wondering if you could share like if you ever had a particular experience that like made you feel excited and connected and hopeful about the future um mm -hmm. yeah um it, it, maybe not a particular experience but i think something that's been sort of characteristic of my personality and also throughout my career is like when people say things can't be done i just want to demonstrate they can be done um and so uh when i was a postdoc or actually when i was a phd student in coming out of a cosmology phd group PhD group, but like trying to figure out how could I get a job as a postdoc studying origins of life. And in particular, as a theoretical physicist, I was like, no idea how to do this. And a lot of people advised me not to work on the origin of life because they thought it wasn't a solvable problem. And instead of backing away from that, I thought, well, isn't this great? No one knows how to solve it. And therefore, no one's actually asking like the questions about how to solve it. So if I start doing that, you know, it might not mean I'm going to make progress, but it means there's a space there to actually work in and try to do something. And if no one's doing it, it's obviously not going to happen. So it would be a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I just wanted to try to do it. Um, and I think that that's sort of the way I like to work is like I like to take things people think aren't uh, possible or look at things in ways that people haven't before. So there might be like a narrative people are using to describe something and it seems to me like that's a closed scenario. It's not like really helping us see new ways of thinking about that problem that open up new spaces. So I like to like play with ideas and and do things that way. So um, so I don't know if I have a particular event, but I think like just the way I work is like trying to, again, I guess it's that taking negativity and turning it into positivity. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know. 
um, if that answers your question, but yeah. Uh, I think it does. It, it provides uh, a lot of context on like what makes you feel uh, excited about the long-term future, I think. Yeah. And I guess for, for young people that might want to go into uh, fields where people tell them things aren't possible, I think, you know, sometimes it's worth, if you really think, you know, you're like you're super passionate about that and you think that there's a there there that other people just aren't seeing, it's sometimes worth going for it. Yeah. Are there any like, um, and like areas or technologies that you think are undervalued right now that more people should pursue? Um, I mean, I actually think the origin of life problem as a problem for technology is very undervalued. Um, and that's clearly coming as my bias as somebody that is deeply passionate about this area. But I, like, I've been working for a while, um, again, with uh, Lee Cronin, I'm developing this uh, origin of life uh, and theory of life, but also on this idea of like, could we build a large scale original life experiment and like, and the idea is actually to think about the original life as a search problem uh, through chemical space, though not like not computer algorithms or a search engine, but can you actually think of the space of possible molecules and build a evolutionary engine that operates in chemistry that actually searches for new life forms in chemistry? And I think the reason I'm so excited about that idea is one is I, I come from a tradition, obviously in particle physics of like, theory motivating these very large scale experience experiments to like probe very fundamental aspects of our universe. And we don't think about origin of life that way at all. But I think if you want to think about the physics of it, it's the same kind of scale problem. But also if we solve that problem and we really know how the universe generates information and then it generates novelty based on information, I think that's a much more embodied way of thinking about what software is and what algorithms is and, and how they emerge in the universe from this sort of disembodied way that we currently talk about it in technology. And so I just see this like really interesting future of technology that's much more embodied if we can solve the origin life problem. Whereas right now, a lot of the reason I think we don't understand our own technology is because it's so abstracted from the physicality that it's really hard for us to even know what we're creating. Um, uh, I'm interested in your use of the word embodied, but yes. uh, <laughs> for... Um... For example, like that is one of the things about, I think, the the whole concept of how we think about existential hope at foresight is like how we can make people feel the like embody a positive vision of the future more. Yes. Of. Yeah. Um, but yeah, how, how do you think about using that? And also, do you have a specific like uh, if you could share like a vision of existential hope for the future? Or yeah. Um, so I guess embodiment for me. So actually... Uh, I think I have kind of a different idea of what's physical to most people. So most people think like matter is physical and like atoms are physical and algorithms and mathematics and those things are not physical and they exist in some like platonic world. And what I think is physical is not actually the individual, like is, um, is all that is what I think is physical is actually what most people call informational. Um, in the sense that, like, if you look at complex matter, um, what's physical about complex matter, like the actual physics that governs things like us, is how they, those objects are constructed across time and, like, how inf like what are the operations necessary for building those objects. And for me, that's actually the underlying structure of the physics of life. So if you take something like a molecule, most people might look at the molecule as the physical molecule in the three-dimensional structure and weigh its mass. And I would say the actual physical structure of that molecule that's relevant for thinking about it as an evolutionary object um, and an object constructed by the universe is all the ways that the, the universe could build that molecule based on the physics of our universe. And then that becomes the object in the theory. Um, and so I have this sort of view of embodiment, like what's physical in this kind of temporally extended sense um, of understanding where objects come from and, and what are the ways of making them and then how does that actually make new things come into existence. And I don't think that that's really translated into something that we understand as a general physics yet, although we're trying to work on that. And and I think if we understand that, then there's some capacity um, to steer our future, I guess, in some sense. And kind of like, if you could imagine, um, you know, like we have this idea that uh, biological systems have agency and goals, but we don't know how to impose those things as a planetary scale process. So I wrote this paper with some collaborators on this idea of planetary scale intelligence, which is, you know, like right now we we have some intelligent systems that might be operating globally, but the planet as a whole doesn't act like an intelligent system. And, um, but you can see some rudimentary 
uh, processes that might suggest it could be an intelligent system. So, for example, people think climate change is a really bad thing. And of course, um, it might be an existential threat. But what's super interesting about what's happening with climate change is that we're modeling possible futures for the planet um, in, a, in a way that we're trying to respond and now steer those possible futures. So if you think about like the earliest emergence of life and emergence of agency in, in systems evolving goals or understanding like what the future space of possibilities is and trying to steer among those, um, you know, you start, you're starting to see some of these features of life again occurring at a planetary scale. So I guess my, my existential hope is that uh, life is really an open-ended system and that we will really see these features re-emerging on different scales and it will continue to persist into the future and generate more things and more possibilities and hopefully also improving, obviously, like it's not just you want a lot of life, you want the quality of life to be good. Um, but I feel like solving the origin of life is a critical transition in the evolution of any biosphere because it's like, the biosphere learns about its environment, it learns to see, it learns to hear, it learns to think, and then it learns, uh, you know, to invent tools and technology. And then it learns something about the laws of the universe that work, it lives in. And then it learns something about itself, which then allows it to do things that it wouldn't, you know, like, I just think that transition to me is just super fascinating um, to get closer and closer to understanding what you are and, and the universe is doing that through us. So it's just all super interesting yeah. i don't know what it looks like on the other side of that transition but i want to help make it happen <laughs> uh, well, thank you yeah um I, i'm a bit curious then because like uh, you and allison just discussed this thing about like uh a sentient ai may be um may not be considered like an existential risk or threat um but would uh, rick in the chat also had a question about like uh, is um, is consciousness all, all that matters or would you be okay with like humanity being replaced by an AI uh, life that doesn't uh, have maybe the same values that we do? Um, I'm pretty sure I'm conscious. So I share the biases of most conscious things. At least I'm talking to you. Like, I'm, I think I'm conscious of what I'm saying to you guys right now. Um, uh, so I, I guess I kind of hope there's an inner world. Um, but I also think this goes, I, I, I think, you know, some of the framing of consciousness is always focused on this inner subjectivity and not so much like what consciousness does. So I really like this paper, you know, Allison mentioned Dan Dana earlier, but he had this um, uh, paper on like what the hard question of consciousness is, what does it do? And I had also been thinking for a while about that question. And for me, I think the thing, the thing that's super interesting about human minds is our ability to imagine, again, counterfactual possibilities and then make them actual possibilities. And I can't help but think like if you really want to talk about consciousness as a phenomena that exists in our universe, it's not really about what's happening inside an individual mind. But if you have a lot of lights on okay. in a lot of physical systems, then that actually has more future generative potential than not. So I think if you looked at the space of selected futures that I don't and the broadest possible spaces, I think consciousness would actually be a key feature of that. So again, this is the optimistic narrative. But um but for me, that's one of the reasons that I'm really interested in understanding consciousness more as a, a property of collectives and interactions of collective agents than thinking about it as a, like the inner subjectivity matters, but it matters to particular dynamical outcomes that couldn't happen without that. Um, and I don't see a lot of framing of discussion of consciousness in humans or machines from that perspective. But I think this is really what people are starting to get at with like human AI interactions. Like, you know, the conscious experience might be between the two entities and not in one individually. And I, I think those kind of things are kind of really interesting to think about. Um, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I haven't really, I haven't heard that, that perspective, but that's interesting that it's in the, in the sort of communication. Um, sorry for jumping between the questions, but like it, you've touched uh, like quite a lot on like how, how you think it is important for us. And you also said that like it's instrumental maybe even to to think about um, the positive outcomes of the future. Um, yet, you know, it seems like in, in the sort of general narrative in the world, it often ends up in the like dystopian visions. Yeah. What what do you think we could even do to like change that? Yeah, I you know, it, sometimes I go back and forth about this. I'm actually not sure we need to change that. Um, uh, except that I think we should inject more positivity and more creativity about what the future could look like for the reasons I stated that we need to build it. But it's also in some sense, when people are talking about existential threats and working on those problems, I'm almost no longer worried about those threats. 
Um, because someone actually recognizes that they are a possibility and they're working on trying to steer us away from it. It's like the things that we're not thinking about that I'm worried about um, in some ways. So I think it's almost kind of like, like the fact that we're having those discussions in some sense is a protective mechanism of trying to understand, like, it's just, a, we have to talk through what the possibility spaces are. And that includes talking about the positive and negative and what we value as positive or negative. And we couldn't do that unless we were trying to build dystopian scenarios as well as utopian scenarios. Uh, and probably what we really want is something in between because neither of those sound like the real optimal. Um, and so um, so I guess what I, I would hope for is just more discussions about the fact that we're actively steering it and just being really aware of the agency that we have um, and what agency we want to give away to technology and how we can build that ecosystem to try to collectively steer things and what that looks like than saying it's totally all bad or it's totally all good, which are probably both equally unrealistic. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So more like awareness of the fact that we are uh, steering it, unable to steer it. Uh, and, and these... Um... Would you say that because it sounds like then we're talking about like the people who are actually working on existential risk. Um, but would you say that even like in the general public, it doesn't really have to change in that way? No, I mean, I, I think change is always good in asking questions about change. But I guess the question is, I would ask, what's the value of having these discussions besides what we're saying? And I can I can give an example that I thought was really funny was when... Um, you know, Elon Musk took over Twitter. There were so many people talking about Twitter on Twitter and Twitter became very meta about itself. And everyone, you know, like all the conversations were about how horrible this is. But then at the same time, if you look at Twitter as a, a collective platform, suddenly it's having this sort of self-referential discussion about itself that it never had before as a collective. And so I think just recognizing the different levels that we're having these discussions and what the discussion is at the level of how we're talking about it between us and what we perceive of it versus just stepping outside ourselves and looking at like, what is this collective discussion saying when we look at all the sides? And I think that kind of perspective is just critically important for understanding what we're doing when we're in large groups and when we're collectives of humans, but collectives interacting with technology is just to try to always take that meta perspective of looking at outside and not just looking at like our personal opinions and how we're arguing with each other. Um, and I think that's just critical for understanding how these systems behave because our opinions are very biased. <laughs> and anything I say is always going to just be stuck inside my own brain and my own history and everything. So, uh, but I, I, yeah, so. Yeah, well, um, yeah, thank you so much. That's so, so I think one thing that um, when we talk about existential, we always also bring up this thing of you catastrophes, like the opposite of a catastrophe. So mm -hmm. if, if we had an event that, um, all of a sudden after that happened, we have a lot more like value. Um, and one of the things that we also mentioned in relation to that is what a terrible name you catastrophe is because everyone just thinks of catastrophe. Um, yeah. do you have any, any suggestions of uh, a better name? It's okay if you don't. Um, that's a tough one. Cause you, uh, yeah. Um, it would almost be better if you described what it was, but didn't give me the word. Cause now I'm still, like, trying to permute, permute that word. Um, so you might try that experiment on someone else in the future. That's my suggestion. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't have one. If I think of it, I'll let you know, though. I'll, think, I'll try to maybe rephrase it for, for another interview then. Um, but then what would be interesting, you already share like existential hope, um, your existential hope vision. But, um, you know, in this podcast, we always try to like create uh, like actually a visual um, um, art piece basically yeah. on, um, on uh, an existential hope scenario. Uh, so I was wondering, like think about what you think also maybe could make uh, a really cool visualization. Um, but what, um, do you have a vision that like a prompt for a vision of the future that you think can be like as inspiring as possible? Yeah, I guess I, I, I'm i I'm very romanticized by this idea of life across all this like scales of complexity on our planet all the way up to the planetary and thinking about this integrated like structure on a planet that, ex you know, is some features of it are in, like 3.8 billion years in depth. And like we ju we're just we we think we just exist in the current now on this planet, but like that entire structure and then 
what are the transitions that are building the future? And like this sort of open-ended possibility space is like that planet, you know, the biosphere emerging on that planet, the technosphere understands more about itself and more about the universe it lives in and can expand beyond that planet. So um, as I said before, like, I think the kinds of transitions we're undergoing now, obviously I'm biased by my time and place in history. So who knows, but um, like, they seem very critical to me as far as we're emerging all of these new layers of complexity and technology that we don't understand, but it's kind of life again, recapitulating at these different scales. And at the same time, I think historically we're at the moment where like, we should be ready to solve the origin of life and chemistry. So if you look at those two things as like our deep history, finally understanding that first moment of life and we're recapitulating life now, reemerging at this different scale, it's just this really interesting kind of loop across like our history and what we're doing and where we're going that I think sets up this kind of like amazing kind of hopeful view of the future of like what the possibility space is when we cross that threshold. Yeah, I, I love uh, actually connecting or thinking about our um, our origin more uh, and, you know, using history to, to understand our future a bit more. Um, actually, like, um, next question for me would be like, um, based on everything that you've told us here today, do you have any like reading recommendations or listening recommendations or something like where can people like start diving in? Yeah. Um, well, there was a podcast that uh, Allison mentioned, if you want to like follow up on some of the ideas I talked about, but, um, and David George came up a few times. I love his books. Um, Paul Davies was my postdoc mentor. Uh, so I learned a lot about how I think about reality from him. He's a pretty open-minded person. He's written like 30 books. Uh, always tells me I need to catch up. Uh, <laughs> but he, um, he has a, a newer book on, um, information in life, uh, that I think is nice. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think, um, and I really like Ted Chang's writing from like a science fiction perspective. So like story of your life is like one of my favorite stories about alien life in part because I'm obsessed with time being related to what life is. And that has such an interesting, you know, like deep relationship between the different kinds of intelligences and minds and how they perceive time. Um, so yeah, so there's just tons of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, thank you. I think those are all all great. I love Ted Chang as well. Um, and I think we have time for like uh, one of the questions in the chat that I think from Creon, for example, he was asking if you've studied um, the works on active interference, um, Marco Blankets and the free energy principle. Uh, yeah. And active inference. And, yeah. And, and, and not just have you studied it, but does it inspire you or change your research program in any substantive way? Um, so I am aware of it. I've read a few of the papers and I've, uh, you know, spoken with some people that work on uh, those theories. I don't find it particularly useful myself because I think it's very, um, it seems ad hoc to me in some ways and not, and not so natural an explanation. I think when you get to brains and you're trying to understand brains and you talk about brains outside of their evolutionary context and just what is a brain as an inference engine, then then some principles of that make sense, which was obviously, I think, the direction that Carl Friston was coming from originally when he was proposing some of these ideas. But I think when you're trying to build the physics from the bottom up and understand the origin of life, I don't think it's so helpful because it has a lot of what I think are unnatural assumptions that might actually be products of evolution. So I, I guess what I would say is like, there's a lot of observers already in that theory. <laughs> And this is the problem okay, with a lot okay. of theories. Yeah. Um, Fair enough. I think I think that I think that actually it's it's a little more applicable to biological and non-brain systems than than you might think. But fine. I mean, you get to choose, and you're you're an expert. Um, I would wonder maybe the same question about information theory in general, like yes. deep, see deep connections between information theory and origin of life and evolution of life. Yeah, so all these things are connected. And also, I should say, like, there are some papers applying, like, the free energy principle and stuff to original life stuff. And those papers are interesting. But again, I think I think there's the issue of, like, how do you build the experiment and how do you actually connect this to the properties of chemistry versus assuming you're labeling things and you can describe them in some probability distribution and information theoretic way. So I have, in my own career, been a long-term advocate that somehow something in the space of information 
environmental properties is related to like the foundational physics of life. So I think all of these things are touching in the right direction. Um, uh, but I don't think that they're formulated in the right way to describe the physics accurately. Um, and part of the, the reason information theory in particular is hard is to do any kind of information theory, you actually have to have, um, you have to build probability distributions, which means you already need to be talking about events that are frequent enough to actually construct a probability distribution from. And a lot of the physics of life that I've described that I think is most important is actually the mechanisms of generating novelty. So it's like you want to talk about the first creation of something in the universe and then how it gets to be a highly reliable and probable event. And once it's highly reliable, probable event, you already have this physical structure selected. You can describe it with information theoretic principles because you can build probability distributions over how likely it is to happen, but it doesn't tell you how you generate those things in the first place. And so what we're trying to do with um, the kind of theories that we're developing uh, with assembly theory is actually unify the novelty generation mechanism with the idea that you have objects in abundance and how do you actually bridge those scales from the universe's first creation of an object to when that object becomes a reliable feature of the universe. So from like, you know, the first incarnation of the, the earliest idea of a cell phone all the way to like everybody on the planet having a cell phone. And information theory might tell, tell you properties of like, you know, the networks of things that are generating information, uh, cell phones on the planet today, but it wouldn't be able to, to predict the emergence of a cell phone from past history going all the way deep in time. And, and, and so there's some features there that I think are missing from those kind of descriptions. Is it another way of saying that, that while the whole concept of novelty is arguably an information theoretic concept, or at least that can be used to analyze the uh, idea of novelty in a formal way that just because something is novel doesn't mean it's going to take off. Yes. That's right. And I think about it as like there's a possibility space of things that can exist and the like things are being pulled into existence by the biosphere over time and then they're being made reliable structures. And this is actually what the evolution of life is. And you so you need to be able to unify that mechanism of of basically actually like generating the first instance ever in the entire universe of an object. And when that object actually can become produced reliably because there's now systems that know how to build it that were selected. Um, it's just the yes, physics of life, I think, not. is so radically different than any physics we've built before. And I think people, that's when things underappreciated. You guys asked me, that's one. Like everybody thinks like life exists in like known physics. And I'm like, ah, anyway, sorry. No, these are great questions, Kriana, as, as usual. So, so, yeah. so, and um, then I'll be quiet after this last one. Yeah. Um, so I think, is, is it correct to say that perhaps in your view, I mean, novelty itself is an, and generation of novelty is an interesting question and it's kind of necessary but not sufficient to explain what's going on because novelty doesn't mean that the novelty will be selected. From. Exactly. So novelty is insufficient and abundant objects are insufficient. You need you need something that unifies those scales. And, and that's actually like sort of one of the main things that we've gone after uh, with, with the stuff we do in assembly theory. And we have ways of talking about those two things in a unified dynamics. Um, and I think for me, that's really, but in order to do that, you get these new concepts of information and time that, that haven't existed. And for, and when also I should be careful when I say information, I'm always using that word as an approximation to a set of things that we associate with information in a variety of different linguistic meanings <laughs> and also, uh, causation. So like, for me, those two concepts are the same and, and some features of those concepts now overlap with what we usually talk about as matter and time. Uh, but, but it's, yeah, they're, they're all language is hard because our language is like these rough patches of things that are out there and we're moving around the meanings of words. Um, and the thing, this class of things that we describe as informational is a really interesting class of things. And so people mean sometimes information in a formal information theoretic sense, and sometimes they mean meanings <laughs> and sometimes they mean like information technology. And so there's just all these different sorts of ways of meaning it. But I, what I really think is important is life seems to be generating structures that are so low probability, you would never expect them a priori from standard physics. And it seems to be able to do that in such a way that it not only generates those structures, but then learns to produce those reliably. And, and that feature, I think, is, is about causal structure and causal dynamics in the universe and also associated with information. And you would need a theory that describes those features. Thank you so much for for uh, um, 
that means that I thank you for uh, continuing the interview. Um, <laughs> I think if you have just 30 seconds, it would be nice to round off sure. with a question. Um, like, what's the best advice you ever got? Oh, um, I think actually, so this, is, this is very, very funny advice, but um, but I got um, like advice when I was very young. My my mom was very much like into like natural healers and like Reiki and stuff. And she like, she had like her, you know, and this is not something that I, I do, but like she had this, um, uh, God, I think I had to take like Reiki one or something. I was like a teenager. It's very, very funny. But the guy that was like te- like doing that with me, um, he said, you know, like it's really important because I, I actually maybe I was in university. I don't remember when this was, but I was already like expressing interest in science. And he was like, it's very important for you to learn those things, but also unlearn what you have learned. So like you can think about them in new ways. And I think that was the, like actually one of the best piece of advice I ever got. So like I've gone through, you know, like an entire formal training of physics. And what I learned is a very rigorous way of thinking about how reality works but I've also done it in such a way that I'm willing to forget historically any feature of what we learned in case it might be wrong, but to try to rebuild it again, but in as rigorous a way as possible. So I think that was actually, I don't know, that that just stuck with me in some weird way. And I love getting advice from like completely unexpected things because you never know what you're going to learn from people, even if, you know, like it's just really unexpected. So. Yeah, that seems like a great approach to life in general. And yeah, it's. Um, yeah, thank you so much for coming and sharing all of your perspectives uh, with us today. It's, uh, yeah, really, really uh, kind of you to share and uh, very, very interesting. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for this like very positive outlook on the future. I feel uh, revived. And- <laughs> That's good. I love the idea of existential hope so much. So I was very pleased to participate. It's great. It's brilliant. Thank That's you so brilliant. much for joining and thank you everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you all for...